Stream a live sports event today. Stream thousands of live and on-demand sporting events from any device. Click link in description box down below to watch full game in high quality. Don't forget to like and subscribe this channel for more sports updates. Thanks for watching and enjoy the game. formation of American flying fortresses, there lies Marienburg in East Prussia. Up to this moment, one of the most important cogs in Germany's war machine. The specific target on which this lead bombardier is lining up his bomb site is the Fokker Wolf 190 plant. Up to this instant, this aircraft factory has been accounting for almost 50% of Germany's total FW-190 fighter assembly. Bombs away. Tons of bombs rain down in a tight pattern of destruction. This, remember, is no area attack. It is an assault on one single target, and any bomb that falls outside that target has failed to achieve its purpose. The assembly of fighters in this Fokker Wolf factory has come to a sudden and violent end. To many, the bombing of Germany probably seems to be little more than a series of capricious adventures one attack unconnected in any way with the one that preceded it or the one that will follow it. It is easy for the average citizen to envision the positions of ground armies because of maps like these, which make the positions of the contesting forces quite clear. It is harder to express so graphically the progress of a bombing program. Yet there is a real line in this battle of Germany, not a geographical front, but an industrial one. In the British Isles, there are the Allied Air Forces. On the European continent, we have Regensburg, Marienburg, Bremen, Horsesleben, Barnumunda, and Kassel. These are the major German fighter assembly plants, and as such, are actually the center of Germany's industrial defense line. However, these are only the places where the aircraft is assembled into the finished fighting machine. Component parts for German fighters are made at Anklam, 
the Weser Flugzeugbau Works at Bremen, the Great Hedderheim Propeller Works near Frankfurt, the Aircraft Tire Factory at Hanover, the CAM Ball Bearing Plant at Paris, and the Ball Bearing Factories at Schweinfurt. Obviously, an assembly plant can't operate if other plants aren't building the parts from which the enemy planes will be assembled. Hulse produced 29% of all German synthetic rubber production and is in fact responsible for 18% of our entire supply of rubber, natural or synthetic. At Bochum, there's a great steel plant producing high-grade aviation steel. Arroyo, up in Norway, is a great producer of aluminum and magnesium, metals which figure importantly in aircraft production. At Harm, there are great railroad marshalling yards, having a capacity of 10,000 freight cars a day. Much of the tonnage handled here is closely connected with the manufacture, assembly, maintenance, and repair of enemy aircraft. And so it is all over Germany and occupied Europe. Everywhere there are plants and installations that contribute directly or indirectly to the making of German aircraft. Industrial bastions which must first be ripped apart before the enemy's armies can be destroyed. The smashing blows by the Allied air forces at Hulse, Arroyo, Regensburg, Schweinfurt, Hanover and Frankfurt have had the result of piercing the German industrial line to the extent of 37 and one half percent of estimated single engine fighter production in September of 1943. If this rate of drop continues, there can be only one result, the eventual disappearance of the Luftwaffe as a defensive force. But these attacks have had other far-reaching effects. For instance, in January of 1943, just when the 8th Bomber Command had started daylight attacks against Germany proper, 42% of the German fighter strength was concentrated in Western Europe, 33% of it in Russia, and 25% in the Mediterranean area. After 10 months of American bombers appearing by day over Germany, the figures line up more like this. On the Russian front, 19%. In the Mediterranean area, 12%. And in Western Europe, 69%. Germany thought it was urgent enough to withdraw fighters from two important theaters, all in a vain attempt to save their crumbling industry from the grim, destructive blows of the British-American bomber offensive. That is why the Battle of Germany is being fought. Now we come to the problem, how are the targets selected? And what enormous effort is necessary for the 10 or 15 minutes that our air task forces will be over any given target. The daylight bombing offensive against Germany is the responsibility of the 8th Air Force. Under the 8th Air Force are the 8th Bomber Command, the 8th Fighter Command, and the 8th Air Service Command, all of whom contribute to every bombing mission. But it is the Bomber Command which is charged with the actual destruction of the selected targets. The Bomber Command, with which this picture is primarily concerned, is divided into three divisions. Each division has a number of combat wings. Each combat wing, in turn, has three groups. This is the chain of command. Since the operations which we are to follow, there have been some organizational changes, but they are principally changes of nomenclature and have not affected the broad strategical and tactical purposes of the organization. For instance, what is referred to as Bomber Command in this picture is now the 8th Air Force. Weather is the greatest single enemy of the 8th Bomber Command, for here is to be found the most changeable, treacherous weather in the world. To keep the most accurate possible check on weather conditions all over Europe, the RAF has established vast communication and reporting systems. Weather planes such as this Mosquito and our own B-17s are continually in the air in an effort to know in advance what the weather will be over Europe and the United Kingdom. Men like this supply a major portion of the data from which eight main weather maps of Europe and of the United Kingdom are drawn each day. In addition, there are four upper air maps and eight maps of a miscellaneous classification. In this room, all weather information is collected, 
coordinated by the RAF and sent out by teletype to every responsible command. This is the weather section in the operations block at the Bomber Command. Here the information gleaned from the weather stations is put together and correlated into weather maps. Accurate predictions must be made as to the direction and speed of the wind, downward and forward visibility, temperature, humidity, possible icing conditions, and probable atmospheric pressure at the bases, en route, and over the target. Upon the findings made in this room will depend whether or not there will be an American bombing of a German target tomorrow. This is the operations room of the Bomber Command. Here is where the wheels are put in motion for any American bombing attack. Right now, the officers you see are waiting for the commanding general's morning conference. They are the A3, or operations officer, the operational intelligence officer, a weather officer, and other members of the staff. What's the weather prospects today, Major? It looks like most of Germany will be pretty good, sir. But we have a warm front approaching from down here, which we do not expect to affect the bases until late in the evening. How's the weather at Anklam? At Anklam, sir, we expect two to five tenths of low cloud and small amounts of middle and high cloud above 18,000 feet. Visibility six to eight miles. How about Marienburg? At Marienburg, two to four tenths of low cloud uh, little or no middle or high cloud, visibility six to eight miles. What will it be at Danzig and Gdynia? At Danzig and Gdynia, sir, two to five tenths.